When World War I broke out, a message was sent by the war ministry in London to a British outpost in, in Africa. Here's what the message read. War declared. Arrest all enemy aliens in your district. Short time later, a message went back to the war ministry that said this. Have arrested 10 Germans, 6 Belgians, 4 Frenchmen, 2 Italians, 3 Austrians, and an American. Please advise immediately who we're at war with. <laughs> All right, for those of you who are in the academy and uh, were not alive or um, awake in 2001, you don't know much about what happened 2001, 2003. 2001, anybody remember what tomorrow we are remembering? September 11th, what's that about? It's about uh, uh, an attack in America by terrorists that attacked the World Trade Center. Incidentally, take note of this. They attacked, if you will, the center of commerce and capitalism, the World Trade Centers in New York. Where else did they attack? The Pentagon center of military authority and rule, the hub of, of what controls literally the military around the world, the, the, the Pentagon. Of course, there was another plane that went down in Pennsylvania that um, people on board actually stopped that plane. Where, where that one is, was exactly headed is not sure, but it was on its way towards Washington, D.C. So might they have been headed for the White House? It's clearly some, uh, some uh, target like that. You might remember that after that, uh, we started the, what was known as the War on Terror. And in 2003, after much deliberation and unfortunately sometimes some information that was not accurate, we entered into Iraq. And, and for those of you who were alive then, do you remember watching on TV that night, 2003, as uh, we saw all these laser-guided missiles uh, hitting many, just hundreds upon hundreds of targets. In fact, I'm, I'm, I was imagining the next morning when you could see light, that whole Baghdad was just going to be gone. Now, they were very precise in the targets that they hit, and we continued on in. You might remember that, um, that they started a ground attack from Kuwait, and within, what was it, within a month and a half, um, Iraq had been taken over and conquered, and in short time, Saddam Hussein was arrested and tried for his treasonous acts. Folks, today we have fear and concern because of North Korea, who has nuclear capability and nuclear arsenal, and they've been continuing to work on how they can deliver um, missiles right here to the United States. Um, by the way, good news, um, you're on the western coast, so uh, at least you would go first. There you go. Why do I mention all this? Wars and rumors of wars, Revelation is very clear that at the end times, and are we in them? Only the Lord knows. We're clearly in end time behaviors. Wars, the kind of things that are taking place across this land, across the globe. Um, I was speaking with a lady yesterday from Malaysia. And she talked about the fact that in her country, Malaysia, and Indonesia is similar to this, that, that Christians, Hindus, and Muslims used to get along well together. In fact, the country was Hindu, was, wasn't Muslim at first, but today, um, Malaysia is now a Muslim country, and Christians are sought after and killed and punished simply because they worship Jesus Christ. I mention all this because what we need to understand is, is that we are at war. And the war is much more serious than many of us want to comprehend or really probably want to know. And it's a war for the freedom of people's souls. It's a war to go and break down the gates of hell and set people free. And it's a war that requires Diligence, it require, requires commitment. It re requires an understanding of the weapons to fight that war. And God did not send us into this world to just sit here and ignore it, but to be equipped to do battle. And this morning, we want to try to understand what some of those weapons are that God has given to us. The message of the 
for the title of the message today is we don't fight like the world does well I guess unless you're Baptist you see Baptists have kind of historically you know we, we get in a fight with one another we don't like what somebody's doing we go start another Baptist church okay or another Baptist denomination. Now we have Heinz variety of Baptists, okay? And, so, and the sad thing is, is that 2 Corinthians is going to say, we don't fight like the world does. But the fact is, too often we do. Let, let's, let's be a little bit frank about what has taken place in past years right here in this facility. Do you know that in this facility, we have had two worship leaders call the cops on one another? Well, actually, it was one of the wives that called. Call the cops on one another for right here, something going on in this building. You know that at another time earlier than that, that there were a couple of worship leaders that were outside ready to go to blows and have a fist fight. But what did the text, what, is the, what did I share with you? What's the title? We don't fight like the world does. No, because uh, sometimes the world's just straightforward, and instead what we tend to do is gossip. We backbite, we dissent, we beat up people by what we say and think about them. We criticize and attack, and we say we're not fighting like the world does. And it's a mistake. Too often, we fight worse than the world does. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we live in the world... We do not wage war as the world does. That's a declaration Paul's making. For those who really follow Jesus Christ, he's saying, if you, you, even though you're in the world, and we all are, and even though there's all kinds of pressures and all kinds of things going on around us, we don't fight like the world fights. We don't wage war the way the world does. He goes on, he says, verse 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary... They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We don't fight like the world does, Paul says, or at least we shouldn't. I want you to think for a few moments, what are some of the weapons of the world? Anybody to play Mortal Kombat or a game like that? Old man. <laughs> a few, okay, Mortal Kombat, right? And what are you doing when you're, when you're playing Mortal Kombat? You're going on there and you're, and you're hugging people, right? You're welcoming them into your home, right? <laughs> or you're, you're becoming a guest in their house, correct? Well, obviously, I'm being pretty facetious here, aren't I? You're, the whole job of a Mortal Kombat is go in and wipe everybody out. Kill them off, shoot them dead, and you win. That's the way the world fights. When the world gets upset when countries get, uh, get hostile towards one another. Well, today, we either use a military power or what's the other one? We use cyber power. <laughs> okay? Cyber power. We're going to mess up your computers. If you want to destroy this country, by the way, you know what you do? You attack the electrical grid for this, for this country. If you attack the electrical grid, within three days, people will be without food, water, and shelter. Within a week, people will be dying, not just in the hospitals, but in the streets. And a few days after that, anarchy will spread, and people will start killing one another to get food and other items from their neighbors. And you will destroy this country. That's how dangerous and serious something as simple as the electrical power grid is. We're not supposed to fight like the world, and yet, the, what are the weapons of the world? Why don't you think about this? Don't most people use power anger, and even weapons like killing somebody in order to defeat their enemy? Do you? The weapons employed, they cause physical pain. In fact, have you ever gotten in an argument with somebody in your family? Mother, father, husband, wife, son, daughter. And what do we start to think? We start thinking of attacking. We start thinking hostile. And sometimes we even do physical pain as well as verbal pain to those other people. Some weapons, they, all they do is inflict emotional pain, like unkind words, verbal attacks, and lies. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 goes on and says, For I'm afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. By the way, that's his warning because when he's coming, he's going to address some very serious issues in the Corinthian church. 
and they might not like it. He says, I fear there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. The Corinthian church is messing up in all different kinds of ways. They're attacking one another. They're hostile with one another. They're arguing and dissenting. They're gossiping. And in addition to that, there's all kinds of sexual immorality. Paul actually warns them about a, a, a young man who's, who's having sex with his father's wife. That would be stepmother, just so you're wondering. Okay. He says, look, you guys are accepting, accepting all kinds of sexual immorality, and it's wrong. And you need to stop it. And he's coming, and he's going to address all that. 1 Corinthians 3, 3 says, you are still worldly, for there is jealousy. Anybody jealous of anyone here? Do any of you quarrel with anyone? Are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Romans 1, 20. Excuse me, I'm going to pick it up at verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. We don't fight like the world, or at least we shouldn't. And Paul's going to go on. He says, our, our weapons, our weapons have divine power. I want you to think about it. Last week we talked about the rhema of God, a specific spoken word of God and how much authority comes in that specific spoken word of God. Here's a great one. If, I can, if you, you confess your sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a word that, that, that if you use it and you apply it and you do what that word says, and God actually tells you, confess your faults. Go to your brother or your sister. Tell them what you did. Admit it. Be honest about what's going on in your life. If you take that step, that if you do that step, and if you're honest and you're sincere and you go to that person and you open things up with what's, what you've done, not trying to attack them, that that is an incredible weapon to use, the Word of God. And the second weapon we talked about with last week, sometimes we forget this is listed in the spiritual weaponry of Ephesians 6. The second weapon is the power of God available to us through prayer. By the way, it's not a prayer where you're praying, you know, okay, God, that person's sinning, so you just mess them up, God. Or they, I don't like what they just said, so God, you just you beat them up, God. No, that, that's still fighting with the weapons of the world, isn't it? If you're still trying to do the way of the world and asking God to do something in the way of the world, you know, God, you, you put vengeance on them. God, you judge them. That car that just cut me off, give him two flat tires at the same time. Run him into the center divider. Just don't let me run into him from behind. Okay. You, I mean, if you're, if you're using the weapons of the world, you're going to think that kind of way. Don't try to use the weapons of the world when you're talking to God. Use prayer in a way that starts working on you. But there is a powerful tool that we have in prayer and the spoken, the rhema, the word of God. According to Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, God has given us all the resources we need. We read that last week. We'll look at it again a couple of times. Is it, but remember, we're in a battle, not against flesh and blood. Too often, folks, those of you who are married, you, you forget this one. Way too often. You think that when you get in a disagreement with that spouse of yours, that it's all about them. Of course, it's not about you. It's obviously all about them. 
But when you get in that, in that battle, you're forgetting and not realizing that there are spiritual forces that want you to be at odds with your husband or your wife. Oh, by the way, incidentally, for those of you who have parents, what did he also warn? He also warned that there, we have issues with our parents too, don't we? Did that ever happen? Yeah, honestly, anyone here who's a son or a daughter, I think that's everybody. Anyone here who's a son or daughter, have you ever argued with your parents? No, come on. Have you ever argued with your parents? And it was obviously their fault, right? They're the ones messed up. We all know parents are messed up. Kids have it together. It's the parents that do things all wrong, right? And what's really tough is when they're already dead and you're still arguing with them. Okay? It's, it's hard to win those battles. Our weapons have divine power. Tony Evans said Satan's job is to get us to ignore the spiritual realm or give it low value or look at it inappropriately and worship spiritual beings other than God. If he can divert us from the spiritual realm, he can divert us from finding spiritual solutions. We're in a spiritual battle. It's not against flesh and blood, but too often we fight like we're in just dealing with flesh and blood. We're dealing with principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in heavenly places. We are dealing with demonic beings, folks. And, and evil is glad if we think they don't exist. Evil's thrilled if we either put too much emphasis on them and get scared, oh no, they're the demon! Or if we like, there's no such thing. <laughs> Crazy pagan people thought there was. You know, that's just where they're dumb. Hmm thinking that the dumb people might be the ones who deny them. Paul warns us that the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who reject the gospel of the Son of God. That spiritual forces are actually out there blinding people. What concerns me is have believers been blinded from the work of darkness, from the work of Satan? Clinton Arnold said it this way, Jesus was fully aware that there was a supernatural enemy who would organize his malevolent forces to powerfully oppose the carrying out of his mission. With this in mind, Jesus assured his followers of his presence with them and that he possessed all authority over, the helmet, over, the, over this realm. Evil is out there. Evil is battling. Jesus is saying, look, you're going to be dealing with darkness. You're going to be dealing with demons. I'm actually going to equip you and give you the authority, the power you need to defeat those demons, but you're going to fight them. Now use the resources. So he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey all things. And I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. God's given us weapons, 2 Corinthians says, when those weapons have power to demolish, to demolish strongholds. What's a stronghold? Well, think about it first off in military terms should have one of the students do this and do it much better, but in military terms, a stronghold was a tower or similar structure that was used to scale and defeat a walled city. Or a walled city could actually be a stronghold. Think of Jericho, if any of you know the story. Okay, Jericho was a very much a stronghold. People could not penetrate the walls of Jericho. Jerusalem was another one. Did you know that the, the walls of Jerusalem and the, and the, the Temple Mount had never been attacked from the southern side? What's funny has never been attacked from the southern side until the Eight-Day War when the Israeli soldiers attacked, climbed that wall. You can remember it, Leslie. Climbed that wall up the steep slopes there and actually entered the Temple Mount and took it over Israeli soldiers. First time it had ever been, if you will, conquered from, from the southern side. Why do I mention all that? There are strongholds, there are places, fortresses that evil wants to hold on to, fortified places or fortified tools that evil wants to use against you. Anybody ever feel guilty? <laughs> Thank you. One person. <laughs> you, you fight guilt, right? And along with guilt comes shame. And then when you blow it, because we all end up blowing it sometime again, right? Then when we blow it again, then what is Satan? What is evil? Because it's not Satan. Just a demon. What did the demon want us to do? Was say, see, you're never going to change. You're always going to be like that. See, you're no good. You're rotten. You're terrible. You're just a failure. And that's a fortified fortress 
a stronghold that evil is holding on to. Don't give in to it. I like Bob Munger's little book, My Heart Christ Home, and he calls a fortress the closet upstairs in his house. In this little booklet, he's saying to, to God, okay, God, I want you to, 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 to live with me here in my house. He's invited Jesus into his life. And he starts spending time in different rooms with Jesus. And, and he has a fireside room where he goes and meets with him every day. But, but then one day Jesus comes down from upstairs and says, Bob, your house stinks really bad. And I found out where it is. Bob, you know that closet door that's locked upstairs? Bob, we got to clean it out. Something's dead in there. Well, then he and Jesus go up there, and get, Bob's like, uh, we can't get in there. No, no, we can't go in there, Jesus. You got, you got to stay out of there. You know, I want you to live in my house, but you need to stay out of that closet. Oh, no, Bob. Bob, come on. Unlock the door. We got to go in there. We got to clean out whatever's dead in there. Well, and what's dead in there is the sin and the stuff that's, that Bob's been holding on to, the dark places that he's been trying to keep secret and not open up to Jesus. And Jesus has to open up that door, and Jesus cleans out that closet. And some of us have a fortress. It's a stinky, smelly closet in our hearts that we need to open up to Jesus Christ. Oh, by the way, what are some things that could be personal strongholds? Well, how about this one? Unconfessed sin. Unresolved conflict with somebody that we actually should care about. Bitterness. Unforgiveness. Incidentally, I'll just have to warn you, the last two are actually referred to as giving a foothold to Satan in our lives. That when I hold on to unforgiveness against somebody else, when I uh, hold on to bitterness against somebody else, I'm not hurting them, I'm hurting me, and I'm actually opening a spot where Satan can have a foothold in my life. It's extremely dangerous. We have weapons that can demolish strongholds. They can, we can overcome evil with the power of God. Paul says, look, you've got the ability. Yes, there's strongholds, but you've got the ability. You've got resources. If you'll make use of them, that you can overcome. You can be victorious. You can break down those things that might be affecting your life, that closet that's holding the junk. You can break into the places where, the, where you are being hindered by, God, by evil himself, itself. Paul says, break down your strongholds. Folks, this is when we have to do spiritual work. We may have to get on our knees like a nation, like Nehemiah did with Israel, and confess the sins that we've all committed. Not just us individually, but that we've all committed. See, it's sad, I think, that we live in a time where intellectually and scientifically, we don't deal with spiritual forces any longer. Either we don't think we can, or we don't think we have to. Christian leaders believe that we're in a spiritual battle and we better start using the spiritual tools to be victorious in the conflict or we are going to be in serious trouble. So what are some of our weapons? Well, I've mentioned two already, right? Did you catch them? A rhema of God, a specific word of God, actually using the very words from Scripture and speaking them out loud. That's a rhema, an, a spoken word of God. Secondly, prayer. But here's one that you probably haven't thought of. Did you know that the fruit of Spirit are weapons from God? The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. Now, now look at this. The world fights opposite this, right? So, so the way the world fights is not like this. What's the first one? Go out on the battlefield and do what? Love your enemies. Guys, I'm sorry, but you're going to get in trouble if you do that when you go on the battlefield, right? You're, you're going to get in trouble because you, you can't start with that. And yet as Christians, our, one, of, one of our fruit is love. Here's another one, joy. How many times has your joy been stolen because you were upset at somebody else? Peace. And the peace there is a wholeness, a contentment. What do you, when, you, when you've got yourself right with God, don't you just feel a lot better? That's the peace. In fact, if you have a broken relationship with somebody else and you say, I'm sorry, and they say, I forgive you, don't you feel a lot better? Let me, how many times I've been in an argument with Debbie and I go away and I'm still you know, spinning over it and spinning over it, and until I get back with her, I'm spinning. And the gut's churning. And finally, when we get back together and... Goofus apologizes, then things can get peaceful again. 
and then I feel peace inside. Love, joy, peace, patience. Oh, there's one. Let's, let's, let's just pass on that one, right? Here's a, here's a lie that evil wants you to believe. Don't pray for patience. Why do, I, why do people say that? I have heard more than one Christian say that to somebody else. Oh, no, don't pray for patience. Why? Because if you pray for patience, you're going to get troubles. Really? You're going to get troubles anyways. Why shouldn't you pray for patience? I mean, troubles are coming, aren't they? You're going to go through a difficult time, so maybe it might be wise to ask for the very tool that can help you when you're in the difficult time. But, but somebody, darkness, has said to you, don't pray for patience because troubles are on their way. I'm telling you, it's extremely dangerous and not very smart. Through the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Haven't you ever heard about, you know, you know you're supposed to really, really beat them up with kindness. Beat them up with kindness. What happens if you really did that to somebody? You're really having a hard time with somebody. Your neighbor's dogs are barking all night long. You're ticked off at them, and they're being mean back to you. And you decide you're going to beat them up with kindness. You're going to take something over there, a gift for them. You're going to start praying blessings upon them. You're going to do anything you can to try to be nice to them. Beat them up with kindness. Goodness. Goodness. Doing the things that are going to make a difference in someone else's life. faithfulness. One of our spiritual weapons is our relationship with Jesus. And to be faithful to him. And to demonstrate that faithfulness in the way we live our lives. And here's an interesting one. Gentleness. Most guys, um, <laughs> we have to work at gentleness, don't we? What's, our, what's, what's the phrase? Bull in a china shop? <laughs> We have, we have to work at the gentleness, but you look at a grandpa, big, tough, bur bur burly guy, Sherman, okay? And, and you, see, you see what he's like, Kim, <laughs> see what he's like with a little grandchild. They don't break them. They love them. Incidentally, the word for meekness, anger, strength, power, under control. That's meekness. That's gentleness. Anger, strength, power under control. Use that as a weapon. Oh, and the last one, is self-control. Self-control over your own behaviors, what you are doing with your very lifestyle. It's a weapon used against spiritual forces. Love, joy, peace, patience, guidance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Here's some others. Love of your enemy. I mentioned that from with the first fruit. Humility is one. When you're in a fight, humble yourself. Isn't that what 1 Peter 5 says? Humble yourself under God's mighty hand, that in due time he will lift you up. Humility is an incredible weapon when used in, the, in a spiritual battle. Now, this is one that's a, so important, forgiveness. To be willing to forgive somebody even who has done wrong to you. By the way, don't forget this. Forgiveness is not for the person who wronged you. Forgiveness is for you. When you've been wronged, forgiveness says, I'm carrying around this person's stinking, rotten, nasty garbage. All the bad stuff that they did to me. And I'm going to just hold on to it. Oh, by the way, when I'm holding on to it, what am I doing? I'm opening up this nasty spot where Satan can have a foothold, where evil can have a place of residence inside my own life. Really? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to open up a place for Satan? Well, then get bitter and don't forgive. Just hang on to something that you're really mad about that someone else did to you, and you're going to open up a spot where Satan gets to is welcomed in, and you're the one welcoming him. Forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness says all that nasty, garbage, yucky, stinky, nasty stuff that that person did to me, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to forgive. Oh, just a caveat beyond that. Forgiveness doesn't mean I got reconciled. Reconciliation requires an understanding by the person who hurt me of what they did wrong. And frankly, I might be nice. I no longer hold it against them because I'm setting myself free. But they're never free until they can come back to me and say, this is what I did that hurt you. And I understand. And now I'm sorry. And the reconciliation can't take place until that person who's wronged us understands the pain that they caused us. But before that, forgiveness sets me free. Confession.
and disharmony and hostility and there's this spiritual battle and people are getting literally mad at one another. How are we going to break this darkness that's been here in this community? And one of the things we learned is that obedience is key. One of the very sad things is that too many of God's people are not obeying what God says. Way too many of God's people are not obeying what God says. Jesus was obedient even to the point of death. critical that Jesus mentioned it. Just as he's about to go to heaven, he says, what? Look, I'm giving you this commission. And here's the commission. Go make disciples. While you're making disciples, teach them to do what? Four-letter word. Starts with O. Ends with a Y. B and E are in the middle. <laughs> giving you enough hints? <laughs> Obey. Teach them to obey. Obedience is an incredibly powerful weapon that we can stand against the powers of evil. When we're tempted, when we're under attack by spiritual darkness, obedience to Jesus Christ can give us victory. We've got weapons the world doesn't have. What are you thinking? When you're on the battlefield, what are you thinking? 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it, oh, here's that word again, obedient to Christ. I have an article that I read about a book reviewer. And this, uh, this uh, lady is actually reviewing books for belief.net. Belief.net is a mixture of religions. There's a lot of Christianity on there, but they also have tried to share other religious uh, understandings and, and stuff on the website as well, to different people's beliefs. And she writes, while studying my way through a PhD program, I worked part-time as the book review editor for a large website devoted to religion, spirituality, and morality, Belief.net. Believenet.com, sorry. It's multi-faith. It has articles that would be of interest to Evangelicals, Mormons, Reconstructionist Jews, Wiccans, Baha'is, Hindus, and just about everyone else on the planet. I started this job with the naive assumption that even though I'm a Christian, I could sally forth into this interfaith web world unharmed. I'm capable of separating fact from fiction, truth from falsehood, I thought. I can do the interfaith thing and stick to my guns. For the better part of the year, I have been happily reading and reviewing books about all sorts of faith traditions, volumes of gloomy poetry, memoirs by Jack Spong, John Dominic Crossan, books with titles like Two Days to a More Spiritual You, 
if the Buddha gained it. One night at about 11, I was sitting at my desk reading a vegetarian Wiccan cookbook. I didn't even know they had vegetarian When I got it, I read and write about books because I think they are important. I believe the books we read form us. And as a lifelong bibliophile, I think especially that they form me. What am I doing? Thought my disciple. I've been spending eight months forming my spiritual self on books like Gaia. I hit the floor. I had words with God. I left the office and didn't finish the cookbook review that night. I didn't think flipping through the occasional book about Gaia was going to lead me straight to hell. But I do think case gets cranky when he loses one of his wife. And that he uses whatever tools she's got to get her back, even innocent looking pop spirituality books. After my epiphany with the cookbook, I, I began praying for discernment before I went to work. I prayed to be surrounded by a battalion of angels. I prayed that Satan would be kept far behind. I prayed I opened a book, any book, even one published by a respected evangelical publisher. I prayed that God would make it clear if I was not supposed to read the book in question. And I prayed that I was meant to read it. He would, if I was meant to read it, he would give me the right eyes in which to do it. If he told me not to read a book, I didn't read it. I found someone else to write the necessary book. What Paul said. thoughts are the beginning of every sin you've ever committed. Your thoughts are the beginning of every small depressive moment, of every anxious moment. They all come from your thoughts. Every time you've given in to an addiction, your thoughts started to grow. Every time you've done something that you didn't want to do, your thoughts led the way. So as obedient children, there's that word again, weapon, obedience. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires when you live in this land. Philippians 4, probably one of the most important verses, one that I would recommend and urge, plead with you, beg with you. Can I get the point any stronger? You need these verses. Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Please stand and worship these words. So like I totally forgot something this morning in the welcome. Heard it last week, Alan announced it. It was in the newspaper as well. We raised the funds for the down payment. Yeah. 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 We raised the funds for the down payment. Now, some of you might remember I asked for prayer last week. And the prayer I asked for was that the previous owner and the present owner were like in a battle. <laughs> Fleshly battle. Okay? On Wednesday, they agreed. We prayed on Sunday. On Tuesday, the previous owner came and said, Bill, help me, I'm done. On Wednesday, he shared, and the previous and the present owner said, I'm done. <laughs> that was a God thing. Yeah. Here's the thing. God knows what you need. Sometimes it takes us being honest about you're willing, would you allow us to pray for you? Put your prayer request there in that offering plate. Put your name on it. Let us pray for you specifically. As soon as that's part of the adoption, we're promising we're going to pray. And then you got to tell us how to pray. Like, okay, um, physics, no good. <laughs> right? Some of you, it's going to be math, right? Some of you, it's like, well, I pray more than I want to I've got a asthma, I've got a heartache, the rest of us, okay, right? Serenity. You guys have a battle in anything? Not like the rest of us. The rest of us are dealing with sin. You guys are just dealing with serenity. There's a battle. How can we pray for you? God's wanting us to work together, to unite together, to stand together and fight the fight. Worst thing we can do is be foolish.
much better off than you are. You say, Lord, here's what I need. I'm going to do it. And then you make a commitment to pray for other people as well. So as we sing the song, we're going to invite the ushers to come. The song is forgiveness. Maybe one of the hardest. Instead of prisoner free. 